to get it cut. Is that good? I've got to put my hands up. Well, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. I'm How's that? Yeah. Good. Um, I'm Nancy Lockwood. I am the voter service chair for the Laramie League of Women Voters, and I want to um, give my apologies that Susan Simpson isn't here. We, uh, she co-sponsors. She's the director of the library, and they co-sponsor the forums with us. And she wasn't able to be here tonight. She usually does a little bit of introduction, so I'll try to hit the points that she usually gets. I may miss a few. I want to thank her and her library staff for the setup. They're the ones that are responsible for putting postal maps up, the sample ballots that are on the wall. These are your voting precincts maps, so you can come and look and see what district you're in and what precinct you're in, to know which ballot you should be looking at that you will use to, to vote if you haven't already done so. We're presuming you probably haven't since you're here tonight for candidates. Um, her youth group are the ones who are responsible for doing a lot of the setup and doing, printing the signs. So I do apologize for errors that are on, the, on our signs for the candidates. Um, I think Susan didn't intend to be out. She used a group test and somewhere the proofing didn't get done, so I do apologize for that. Um, before we get started with the questions for the candidates tonight, I'd like to get, take a moment and go over some general information, as well as the precinct map and sample ballots. There is also um, a table at the back here with some general information. There's information on the back table there from the candidates who have brought promotional material, and sometimes they have biographical statements, those sorts of things. I didn't check back there to see what all is there. There's also some informational material about the Laramie League of Women Voters and the League of Women Voters in general. So if you are interested in finding out more about the League, take a look. And there's also membership brochures as well if you're interested in becoming a member of our League. Uh, I think also on the back, and correct me, I've been out of town for the last two weeks and missed the last two forums, but I think we have flyers that give you information and pro-con information about the two tax initiatives that are going to be on the ballot. So we're not only voting for candidates, but there are some issues that will be on your ballots this time. Uh, the two ta local tax issues are the Albany County Transit <coughs> Services Tax and the Albany County Economic Development Tax, as well as an informational brochure about the constitutional amendment that this vote is. It just one amendment, is that right, or is there two? There are three. 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 See, I am. Okay. And those those will be here shortly. Okay, they're not back there right now. Um, oh, uh, <coughs> Susan Easy does this reminder. They, we have done redistricting this year, so remember to check those maps and check your polling places because uh, you're apt to be voting in a different place than you have prior and you may be voting slight, for slightly different uh, candidates based on redistricting and consolidation of precincts. So be real, real careful about checking those things. And if you've moved as a voter, you should also check with the clerk's office about where your polling place is and you need to give them your correct address. I think you actually have to physically go into the clerk's office to do the change of address. <coughs> The general election will be Tuesday, November 6th, with the polling places being open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Or you can vote early by completing a ballot at the county clerk's office or by requesting an absentee ballot from the clerk's office. Election information can be obtained from their website, and if you need a copy of their website, I've got it here, so come see me if you want the web address. Uh, the Laramie uh, League also publishes our voter guide. And that will be published on in the Sunday edition of the paper on October 28th. It's also uh, on the website. I think it's there now, right, Amy? I've got to check. Uh, yeah. Yes. So you can take a look at that now. And I have the link to the website for the lead, too, if you want to see me get that as well. Um, at this time, I'd like to give an opportunity for any candidates who are here tonight that are not up at the front table to answer questions to go ahead and stand up and you can briefly introduce yourself with who you are and what you're running for. My name is Matthew Blaylock. I'm running for Laramie City Council more than one. Anyone else? Right. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll begin tonight's forum with questions for the candidates. Questions 
questions are to be written down. You've got cards that look like this, and the old card catalog cards for reusing and recycling. Um, you can submit those at any time, and if you've got a question, just hold it up, and someone from the league will come around and collect those questions and give them to our moderator. There are pad pen pencils and pads of paper at the end of the rows of the seats. Um, so grab those and pass them around, and then hold up your questions when they're ready. Questions should be directed to the candidates, not, for, or not towards a particular candidate, but to the candidate's position. For each candidate for the position to which the question is directed, we'll be given 90 seconds to respond to each question. We have a timekeeper. Carly Ann will do the timekeeping. She has got signs that indicate, and I've forgotten what we did, a 30 second and a 60 second, and then a stop. The last 20 to 30 minutes of the forum will be given over to information formal conversation with the audience, so when we get to that point, we'll break up and we'll ask you to help stack the chairs. That's one thing I know Susan would want me not to forget, <laughs> is to help uh, put the chairs away, and that will give us more space to mingle. There are There is a map at the very back of the room that, that gives the setup, because she does ask that we set it back up um, for story time tomorrow, so we do need to leave. I think it's usually 10 chairs out a semicircle towards the front up here. So we want to put away all but 10 shares, I believe. We're asking the candidates to please use the microphone and pass the microphone down to the next candidate when you've finished your response. It's got an on and off switch. Um, it's quite easy it's just to leave it on and just try to pass it as quietly as you can so it doesn't pick up a lot of outside noise. We are taping the forum. It will be available on the website, on the league's website, as well as the library's website, so that if you want to view it later or you have other people that weren't able to come tonight, let them know that they can access it from there. Uh, anything else I've left um, Nancy, if I yeah. may, there is also information about judicial retentions. Ah, and you. Albany is one of the counties that will have um, a judge standing for retention in this election. And that, that information is very difficult for anybody but lawyers to acquire. And so the league is trying to sort of make it more digestible and more accessible. Um, you can visit the State Bar website for the full survey. Um, we have a summary, and the summaries will be on the uh, State League's website for all the counties. Thank you. Thanks. And now I'm going to turn things over to our moderator. Jean Garrison, who is a faculty member at UW, she's a professor of the uh, global and areas in the global and area studies program. Can I get it right? <laughs> and also a league member. So, as a second, I'd just like to welcome everybody. Um, let me also say that um, I will enforce the time limit because we have such a fantastic slate of candidates that we want to hear from everybody tonight. And let me just say that I have a fistful of questions here, and I just want the audience to know that some of them are very similar, so I will be combining questions and using my discretion to move us across a range of issues uh, this evening. And I'd like to start very briefly if each candidate would simply state their name uh, and what you're running for, please, and your party. Tim Chestnut, everybody for the United States Senate, Democratic Party. Joel Otto, running for the United States Senate, Wyoming Country Party. Chris Henriksen, running for the U.S. House of Representatives, and I am a Democrat. Richard Brubaker. Right for the U.S. House of Representatives, Libertarian Pickens. Daniel Cummings, U.S. House of Representatives, Constitution Party. John Wills, U.S. House of Representatives, Wyoming Country Party. My name is Phil Nicholas. I'm running for Senate District 10 here in Albany County. 
Good evening. I'm Kathy Connolly. I'm running for re-election in House District 13 here in Laramie. Party? Democrat. <laughs> My name is Tim Nyquist, House District 14. I'm a Democrat. No, no and that mic in particular, you really have to speak into it. Did you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Kermit Brown, running for re-election in House District 14, Republican. I'm Johnny Mendoza, and I'm running for House District 45, um, State Legislature, and I'm uh, a Democrat. My name is Matt Green. I'm a Republican candidate for re-election, House District 45. <laughs> My name is Kennedy Penn O'Toole. I'm a Democrat, and I'm running for House District 46. Uh, my name is Glenn Moniz. I'm running for re-election in House District 46, and I'm a Republican. My name is Michael Hendricks. I'm running for House District 47. I'm a Libertarian. My name is Jerry Paxton. I'm running for House District 47. I'm a Republican. Well, we have um, several questions focusing on um, energy and energy extraction in Wyoming. Um, this is for everybody. So we're just going to go down. We're going to come back up the line. Uh, for years, we've talked about Wyoming being so heavily dependent on, en on energy extraction, but it seems nothing has nothing has changed. Is it our fate to be an energy colony of the U.S., or can you offer some specific means to diversify the state economy? You start with me. Yes. Well, you know, I think for the immediate future, certainly we are destined to, to be heavily dependent on the mineral extraction industry. Although we have seen some movement in uh, different directions, uh, over in Carbon County where I am uh, a resident, we uh, have now uh, have plenty of, of wind farms going up. One is going to be the largest one in the United States. It will be a revenue producer for us, uh, not only in the form of tax revenue to, to, at the uh, beginning of the project, but also uh, there will be a production tax on the wind industry, so I think that's some diversification we can see. I think that uh, we're looking at some infrastructure changes that really would help us uh, in the form of uh, broadband and other things that certainly can uh, help us diversify our income stream, and I think we do need to diversify, although, uh, like I said, for the immediate future, I think that uh, we are destined to depend very heavily on the mineral extraction industry and probably will continue to do so for uh, a number of years. Uh, well, I think there is starting to become some uh, diversity within the Wyoming economy. Uh, for one example, I'm a computer programmer. I came here to live because the cost of living is excellent. Uh, communication systems are, are good enough that I can, can work from home. Uh, I think <clears throat> as technologies begin to evolve in that direction, I think uh, Wyoming will become a popular place for a number of different industries. Um, having said that, uh, I personally don't trust myself or the Wyoming legislature to properly diversify Wyoming's economy. I don't think that any one person can plan that. Uh, we've seen planned diversity in economies in places like uh, China and Russia, and it never works out very well. Uh, so my personal preference would be for the state legislature uh, to just leave hands off, treat all industries equally, uh, treat them all the same, no special tax exemptions, no special bonding authority for any particular group, and simply uh, let the cards fall where they may. I think the intelligent, hardworking people of Wyoming will, will solve problems and, and find uh, useful things to do here that, uh, that I think the legislature, uh, even even with their, their best intentions, uh, simply doesn't have the, the knowledge or the ability to to see into the future far enough to do that. Thank you. I, I currently serve on the House uh, Minerals Business and Economic Development Committee, so uh, I think I'm one of the first from Albany County to serve on that committee, and, and it's been an honor for me to serve. There, uh, actually, the state of Wyoming is uh, looking into diversifying our economy uh, quite readily, actually. It's, as Jerry mentioned, in, in Carbon County, UKRW is in the process of looking at a coal to liquid uh, uh, plant uh, that will really boost that economy up there. Uh, as we just seen, they just finished with NCAR, so our, our computer capabilities in the state of Wyoming is 
been increased uh, quite readily. You look up around uh, the uh, northern part of the north uh, east part of the state, we're looking at rare earth minerals. Wind obviously still is a player in, in the state. Uh, we have a number of companies looking at it, enhanced oil recovery. Uh, so with all of those continuing, I would also I agree with my, my colleague that I have here. I, I think if we continue to encourage business in, in the state of Wyoming and be friendly to business, uh, the business will uh, will help us increase our diversity in the state. Thank you. Um, we are obviously very dependent on minerals and the revenue that they produce here in Wyoming. Um, and I don't think that's anything any of us would argue with. And we are lucky for that. We don't have to pay income taxes. Um, we receive huge benefits from this. But at the same time, there is a cost to um, our economy being so dependent on one um, sector. Um, and we're faced with dealing with environmental problems that are coming out of our minerals and energy industry. So those are real concerns that we have for the future of how um, we can take an industry that has provided so much for Wyoming um, and focus on how we can improve into the future, how we're going to better protect our environment, which Wyoming in many cases has not done a great job at, um, and how we are going to um, take what we've got already and build on it. Thank you. I strongly believe we need to diversify our state's economy to get away from the boom and bust cycle. Uh, the question asked for specifics, and Glenn already mentioned the NCAR, where the state appropriated millions of dollars to support that endeavor. Uh, two years ago, we supported $15 million to attract mega data centers, and now Microsoft is moving into Cheyenne. So things have been done at the state level. Also, we have the Wyoming Business Council, which the state funds to attract small business. We've had projects throughout Laramie with that. I think with the NCAR and with the mega data centers, it's gonna have second and third order effects on education and improve our education in the state. Uh, it's gonna show kids that they can get a job in science and technology and also with mathematics to improve our education in our state, which I think is also a great way to diversify our economy. Well, I don't think it's a, a mystery or, or a, a surprise to any of us that we really are very dependent upon the energy and energy development in the state of Wyoming. But I think that it's really, really important also to think about the issues of diversity and, and uh, diversifying our, our uh, the impact of, of energy in the state. Wind energy certainly is an alternative. And I think that we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that we really must be uh, conscientious players in the world economy and, and develop some industries that are going to complement uh, the uh, uniqueness that we have in Wyoming, our clean air, our clean water, and protect that environment. And I, I agree with my colleague. Kennedy, when she says that we haven't done a very good job about that, and we really need to be careful about that. If we're going to think about our future and about our children's future, we really need to have a state that's going to be conducive to their growth, to their, their future in Wyoming. Um, I think energy certainly is important. It's, it's providing a lot of jobs, a lot of um, income in our state, but I think we need to look seriously at diversifying our, our uh, footprint. Well, it may be our fate to be uh, hooked to the energy industry for a long time. It will be until we find another way. Uh, a couple of things are going to happen in the future. By 2050, the population of the country is going to be half again what it is now. If Wyoming follows that trend, we're going to see population density like we've never seen before. By 2050, the electrical load is going to double as well, at which is going to create huge new energy demands. We have natural gas, we have some alternatives, that, that, that we work on, but I do think that the energy in Wyoming is gonna be uh, uh, the core supply for the base load for a long time. We should diversify, however, we all have to understand that when we diversify, somebody else is gonna be fishing in our fishing hole. And I think that's a, a, a place where we've had a little bit of a problem in this state. We can't decide whether we wanna be bigger and have more population density that diversifies our economy or not. We've tried a number of projects in this state with very little success. So now we work with the business council, we build business ready communities, and we try to create an atmosphere where business growth can uh, 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 foster and we can have some diversity. And uh, that is being fueled by the energy industry and I think that that's uh, 
the way eventually we'll work our way out of it, but it may be a while. You know, we are the energy state, and I think I'm a little frustrated now uh, that we don't seem to be totally leading by example, and we need to push the envelope uh, in energy efficiency, renewable energy. We need to be responsible stewards of our abundant fossil fuels. Um, right now, uh, one of the things that people are uh, totally missing the boat on is the fact that uh, Wyoming has no energy code. With no energy code, uh, uh, we're not doing much to help uh, uh, our energy problems. Uh, think about having an energy code that, for instance, the International Energy uh, IECC uh, code is uh, the 2012 version is superior to anything that we have in the nation. And if we start going energy efficient, all of a sudden our, our, uh, uh, our consumption is going down. If we are uh, uh, doubling by 2050, we will, uh, in population, we will be able to fix a lot of that. 90% uh, of our homes are uh, without energy codes. So uh, our economy can be helped in a very large way if we uh, create jobs, the building industry can start doing uh, uh, energy efficient retrofits. These are jobs that we keep here in Wyoming. These are jobs that can not be shipped out. Um, meanwhile, we are using less energy, um, making our buildings more comfortable and healthy. We're lowering dependence on uh, foreign energy sources, uh, lowering the cost of living. Please, time's up. Okay, thank you. And I will just interject that I reiterate lots of the points that many of my colleagues have already said. We are a state that is incredibly fortunate to have lots of energy resources. Natural gas, coal, clean coal, wind, solar, and we need to pay attention to them. We also need to pay attention to the environment in relation to that. We need to pay attention to fracking. We need to pay attention to air quality. Um, all of those kinds of environmental issues which I think gets us into one of the areas of diversification of the economy that hasn't been mentioned yet. Our, our second biggest revenue generator is our tourism industry. And I think we should pay more attention to that. We have a pristine natural environment. It's our responsibility to be good stewards of that environment. And to do so, we need to pay attention. And then I think that what we can do is we can increase our tourism industry in ways that we haven't in the past. But we also really need to pay attention to diversification in terms of good paying jobs. I was just looking at the most recent Wyoming Labor Force Trends Report, and in the last year, the, ma the overwhelming majority of jobs were for those who required only a high school diploma. We need to diversify our economy so that those with higher education we recruit and we retain here. And in particular for women, we have the worst wage gap in the nation. We need to do something to reduce that gap and that's with good paying jobs. Thank you. The direct act question, answer to the question is in, in our lifetimes with everyone in this room, it's unlikely that we'll ever change the, uh, the dynamics of our budget. I just looked it up. We've received a little over a billion dollars of federal mineral royalties last year, a little over a billion dollars of severance taxes. You add in all these bonuses in the range of three or four hundred million dollars and uh, AML funds, which are going away. So our budget is 60% dependent upon the revenues that are derived from minerals. So when you're talking two and a half billion dollars worth of revenues, 500,000 people, if every man, woman, and ch child were paying taxes, which they don't, it's very difficult, unlikely that you're ever going to pay that, uh, cont contribute that, make up those dollars in any other fashion. You add to that the, uh, the notion that uh, with those taxes, much of the sales tax in the state is paid by the mineral industry. If you went to an income tax, most of your income that would be taxed would be from folks that are driving the largest income, which is, comes from the mineral industry. So when we do the analysis of, of what you're going to do with respect to your, uh, the diversity, that largely represents jobs. You want to have more jobs and more diversification. But as we recruit these jobs, and as we're more de uh, with the dependency we have on minerals, you're sh simply shifting to minerals a larger obligation to pay for the infrastructure. That's not to say that we won't uh, and shouldn't be diversifying, but it's jobs that you're diversifying 
and we do not have a solution in any time quickly for the uh, that solution of buying up three billion dollars. Thank you. I think that was the start. <laughs> I'm running for the U.S. House, so uh, my comments are uh, directly related to what uh, all the previous speakers have spoken about, but I'll give you my uh, opinion about what Wyoming should be doing. And quite frankly, Wyoming should not be doing central planning. The Wyoming Business Council and various other uh, expenditures that the state of Wyoming has done over the, the years to try to to gerrymander or to uh, engineer uh, a change of direction have invariably failed, and guess what? That's not a surprise. Socialism fails. Uh, so the best thing that I think that the state could do with the two and a half billion dollars that's coming in, that's a windfall, that's a wonderful amount of money, is to decrease the burden on Wyoming taxpayers. Now there's two taxes that are really uh, relevant to uh, Wyoming, and that is the sales tax, and that applies both to businesses and um, to individuals. And the second is the sales tax, or, I'm sorry, is the property tax that primarily only applies uh, in large numbers to, to uh, corporations. If those two numbers were, those two rates were reduced, I think that the a number of businesses of various industries that would flock to Wyoming would far exceed Thank that which could be done you. with engineering. I don't see our dependence on energy totally as a problem. We should be grateful that we have a product that is so prized that we can make a good living from it. Most of my concern on the national level will be to protect Wyoming from the various rules and regulations from the federal government. The biggest threat that we have to diversifying our economy is the ideas of central planners who think that they can do better than the marketplace. There are scads of them in Washington. I am committed to cutting their power, cutting their influence, cutting their budgets and leaving Wyoming free to choose. If Wyoming remains <coughs> dependent upon energy, we should be thankful that we have something to solve in future years when America goes into decline if we follow present trends. If the free market brings in diversity, we can rejoice in that also. In either case, I will be committed to protecting Wyoming from the predations of federal bureaucrats. Uh, I work in the oil field. Everything I do is... Please speak, please speak more directly into it. Uh, the job I'm involved in is a lot of oil field completion. I see this big boom-bust issue as my big concern about the oil field. Uh, what people don't realize is that these BLM leases are leased out with a time limit. If they do not drill all the wells within this particular time limit, it's, they lose the lease. They lose all the money invested. Let's spread this out over a duration. Create communities. There is no need. This oil's been here for millions of years. It can take 20, 30 years to drill it. We don't have to have another Jonah Field up behind the house. 20 minutes of a time or a roadblock on the 20 or a mile from the highway. Traffic jams everywhere. The schools, borrowed bits, were full of beer cans. We don't need that. What we need is to stretch these leases out over a period of time and have a sustained economy, economical benefit, which is not damaging to the local economy and is not nearly as damaging to the local environment. One of the ways in which um, we can help 
protect the Wyoming economy and the diversity of Wyoming, the Wyoming economy is to ensure that our higher education stays strong and that people have affordable access to higher education so that they have more options in terms of not only the jobs that they want to seek after, but also in terms of a, a better skill set in order to be able to create and to innovate and to become the entrepreneurs of the future. Um, I am particularly worried about high gas costs, um, in particular because the, the high price of gas is apparently keeping Cynthia Lummis from being able to drive to any form. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, uh, I just think that the question is uh, misidentifying uh, an amazing resource that we have in Wyoming. We have amazing mineral resources and we have amazing extraction industry resources and to identify that as an obstacle or a problem seems strange to me because I don't see how uh, in any way that would inhibit the growth of the rest of the uh, state. Yeah, I don't think there's any question to that. It's we have to diversify. Um, I'm not going to say anything that everybody else didn't say, but shut up. Laramie County is leaving us all behind with the computers and things that they've got going. We need to have uh, our communities ready to do some of these technology-based things. I think the tourism needs to be exploited, like uh, Kathy said. I also think we're losing millions of dollars a year in the film industry. They're filming movies in Canada that are portraying themselves as Wyoming. There's a lot of money to go there. I think most of these energy solutions are going to be I think fossil fuels are going to be dead in this next century because the young people in this audience and the Germans and Japanese are coming up with new technologies that make them obsolete. So we need to be thinking outside the box and, and looking at other, other things to help my own. And the next question will go to all legislative candidates. Can we pass this mic please down to Mr. Nicholas? He'll start. Um, this is a combination of a number of questions. Uh, this is focusing on budget cuts in Wyoming. Why are the state agencies, including UW and community colleges, being faced with a possible 8% cut? What do you uh, think should be done? How will the cuts be made? Should the excess or rainy day funds be tapped to alleviate this? The, uh, the purpose for the 8% cut that uh, is being proposed is to balance the budget in the next biennium. We have a current uh, budget that's balanced but with the decline in mineral revenues that we've forecasted that we know where we're gonna, we are today, we, we're gonna have to cut the budgets in the next biennium and that's where the cuts go. Even with that, we're likely to tap part of the rainy day account, the legislative stabilization reserve account. Uh, this year alone, for example, we've got $45 million worth of fire uh, suppression cost to, to budget for. So we'll be tapping that probably to the to about $100 million. With respect to when the uh, when you tap that one is a rainy day, probably the best definition of rainy day in Wyoming is when the general fund has to pay for part of the cost of educating K through 12, the school foundation program account. Uh, with another dollar uh, drop in or of uh, gas, we will be underwater in that account. That's certainly when, by constitution, is the first uh, uh, priority, so that we know pretty much determine that when we have to hit that account, if we hit it at the tune of about $300 million a, a year over a 10 year period, that would uh, require a $3 billion rainy day account, which is comparable to the rainy day account that was accumulated by our predecessors in the 1980s when we had a $1 billion budget and a $1 billion rainy day account. So we Thank have you very to- very much. There you go. <laughs> Great, thank you. Let me just start with, with saying that my view of when we hit a rainy day is when we are not providing the needed services that our citizens need and when people lose their jobs. Because when people lose their jobs, then individuals, families, and communities can't thrive. So for me, that's when we start looking at a rainy day and tapping into a rainy day account. The rainy day account right now has $1.4 billion in it. That's a lot of money. Now, some will say that that is money that can go into nanosecond, but that's a lot of money. And that is an account that's getting bigger and bigger every year because in all honesty, I think the legislature hasn't done the tough job of deciding when and how to spend that money. And we need to do that. I was actually happy to see that the governor, at the front page of the paper, the governor said, we may need to tap into that. I'm glad. 
many of us have been saying that for a couple of years now. But that is really hard work. And it's much harder work than just saying, cut, 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 which is what's going on right now, or save, save, save. So I think we need to do all of that. We need to do it well. The, I'm going to just end right there. Um, I think we need to stop budget cuts for education. I've watched this happen year after year in and year out. And I'm a little frustrated that we're taking uh, the opportunity away from all our young people to uh, get a good education. Um, of all the problems that face us today, I think the biggest problem is not educating our students. If we can't figure things out, guess what? All of our kids will figure it out, and the reason they'll figure it out is because we're going to allow them to get a good quality education and fix errors done uh, uh, by us in the past. Um, I, I support any legislation to allow uh, raises to educators. Educators going without pay raises has happened uh, uh, for, uh, I think, four years now. I think there's uh, there are a lot of problems with the whole system. I think it's broken. Um, I, I think we should have, uh, have accessible and affordable education options, options for everyone, uh, all the way from pre-K to uh, uh, college, through college, and including vocational ed programs. Uh, some of you have heard me get on my soapbox about this uh, topic, and I don't have time enough now to do it, but understand a mere 15 years ago, just 15 years ago, 1998, 1999, this state was broke. We were flat dead broken. We were dismantling state government because we didn't have the money to sustain what we had at that time. And in a period of about six months, along came what? Coal bed methane gas. And in six months, we were rich. And we've been rich ever since. If you understand where we came from and look at where we are now, I think we're pretty spoiled. I think there's some room in the budget. I don't think that we're doing any systemic harm to state government by looking at 8% cuts. All we're doing is looking at them. Nobody said we're gonna take them. Now, I agree with Senator Nicholas. We have a constitutional mandate to provide an education to children. That's being funded entirely now by federal mineral royalty money. The day that money stops, it has to come out of the general fund first before anything else. $1.4 billion sounds like a lot of money. If you look at the budget, it's, a, it's one year's worth of money, is all it is. So it's a lot of dollars and a gross amount, but when you put it in perspective to how much money we're spending in our state, it's not that much money. And there haven't been, I haven't seen budget cuts in education. I hope we get a chance to, my time's about up, I hope we get a chance to talk about that some more. Well, I agree with Kathy Conley when she talks about uh, taking a look at the rainy day fund, and I think what we need to, to perhaps consider is how ready does it have to get before we actually dip into that fund and try to, try to spend some of that money. At the same time, I think we need to be reasonable about savings. I think that's also really important. But the issue when we're talking about a possible 8% cut, uh, it sounds to me like it's, it's probably going to come through at least in some percentage. Uh, we really need to, to take a look at how we're using that money and how effectively we can put that money to work for the people of Wyoming who need those services and who need the jobs and who need that protection. For the uh, definition of a rainy day fund, uh, I go back to my upbringing. My father was laid off when I was in middle school, and that was a rainy day in the greenhouse. It continued to be a rainy day for the next 10 years. Uh, there are municipalities in our country, not in our state, that are going bankrupt. It is a rainy day in those municipalities. Some foreign countries have 25% unemployment. It is a rainy day there. It is not raining in Wyoming. Now, we need to be, make sure we have fiscal prudence, and what does that mean in application? We need to provide the essential services to the people of Wyoming, but also I don't think our fiscal uh, constraints right now, the broader economic downturn, requires laying anybody off. So that is my number one, number one and number two priority. Make sure we provide the essential services, we do not lay anybody off. And I'll give an example. The Department of Family Services has 793 employees. The director testified to our committee, I'm on Labor, Health, Social Services, and he said, I can cut 30 positions which will not lay a single person off. These are unfilled positions, 
Some have been unfilled since January, and with our normal attrition, we can cut 30 positions without laying anybody off. And because of technological advancements and efficiencies within our organization, there will be no degradation to the people of Wyoming. And I think we need to do that hard look at every agency. I don't think we can do 8% cut for everybody blindly, but I think we need to look at every agency in particular and see what we can do for cuts. I think we have had cuts to education, um, and certainly those of us at UW, um, who's a number of us in this room, have experienced that and are concerned about 8% budget cuts when the university made a very substantial cuts several years ago. Um, so there have been cuts to education and they're more planned. Um, so that is already on, on the table here. Um, we also talk about um, cuts to other people in terms of the social services that Wyoming is providing, and I think that that's a real concern as well. We're talking about people who really need help from the state of Wyoming, and they are experiencing um, really tough times when um, services like the ARC cannot afford to pay people well. Um, their employees would rather go work at Walmart um, if they don't get paid well. So as these budget cuts are taking place, people are being affected, and I think that's the sign that it is a rainy day and we need to be working on these problems. Um, I understand that Wyoming has all states have a balanced budget, and there is concern about that, but I think at the same time, continuing to put money in the rainy day fund ignores the real problems that people are facing today in Wyoming. Oh, thank you. We started this discussion uh, with Senator Nicholas, who chairs the Senate House Appropriations Committee. I don't believe there's anybody in the state knows the state budget better than Senator Nicholas. So. I'm not going to pretend that I know any more than he does, but I'll try to elaborate on, on what I see happening to us. The, the, budget, the state revenue is based on the Craig estimate, or the Craig group that estimates what our, our revenue is going to be in, into the future. The Craig uh, report has told us that we need to let our, our revenue declining, both, both of, most of it due to uh, a, a mineral extraction industry. And so based on that, uh, the governor has asked all the departments, including the University of Wyoming, to look at an 8% budget cut. The process, that it, the process that has taken place is each department, including the university, has went to the committees that they report to and have went over what, how they plan to cut their department's 8%. So these superintendents or department heads have the leeway to determine where they do their budget cuts. As, as uh, Representative Green stated, most of the departments that I've heard on my committees are, are doing their cuts in areas where they haven't filled positions. Uh, as far as rainy day uh, goes, <clears throat> I would agree with the governor and, and Representative Conley that it, it might be time to take a hard look at, at uh, just when we do take a look at the rainy day account, but uh, it will be a collaborative effort and, and I'm confident that the state will do the right thing. So thank you. Maybe I'm the only one on the panel, but uh, I was excited when I heard about 8% budget cuts. I think it's the first time uh, since I've lived in Wyoming, moved here about a dozen years ago, first time I've seen the budget, state budget head in the right direction. Uh, <clears throat> since 2005, the state budget has increased by about 25%. Our pop that's after adjusting for inflation. <clears throat> Our population has only increased by 12%. So we've, we've increased the budget twice as fast as, as any objective need for services. In all honesty, I think we've gotten a little bit lazy in the last decade. We talked about coal bed methane. We've, had, we've been swimming in money. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's time we kind of woke up a little bit and, and realized that we can't, uh, can't just spend money forever. Uh, throwing money at education isn't going to make it any better. What we need is more parental involvement. We need better teachers. I think our teachers need greater autonomy. <clears throat> I think we can easily swallow a 16% budget cut without any feeling in our pocketbook. When I was here in 2005, Wyoming was still a great place to live. We still had plenty of excellent services. Uh, I think we can easily come up with 16%. <clears throat> there was a uh, recent publication from the Tax Foundation which said that Wyoming has uh, more government employees per capita than any other state in the country. Uh, I think we have lots of wiggle room. I don't think we need to you know, be sending people pink slips. There are folks that are ready to retire, positions that are unfilled. I think there's lots, lots of room, and you know we don't need to, to have our budget look like a country club. Uh, you know we can we can trim up a little bit like the people of Wyoming have. I think there's some disadvantage to being at the end of the table here. <laughs> uh, it's pretty hard to, to not plow the same ground 
and especially when you start sending your necklace down there. And that's so, why we rotate. So, so proficient <laughs> at, uh, and, and so knowledgeable about that. But, you know, I think it is a good exercise to, to uh, look at the 8% cut that the, the governor, the government, governor uh, requested. And, and uh, for the reason that we have been growing uh, state government at a, at a pretty rapid rate, and maybe it's time to look and see if there is any fat in that, whether or not we end up making those cuts probably is a lot dependent on the the price of natural gas that seems to be inching up right now, and so that's the good news. Uh, we may may not end up doing that, but I think the exercise at least lets us know where the fat might be. Uh, as far as the rainy day account, I think that the, the, if we haven't hit that point uh, where we're going to need to tap into, we probably will uh, at some time in the not too distant future when we look at our roads and the amount of money that we need to, to restore our roads to uh, to the level where they should be and uh, even raising the fuel tax is probably not going to do that. That's just one more of those uh, issues that we're going to have to find some money for. So uh, I think that uh, we probably are going to have to tap into that sooner or later, but hopefully not, uh, not too heavily. I need the mic to come up here to Mr. Wills. This, the next question is for uh, House and Senate candidates. And I'm just, as a warning, after this question, I'm going to be moving to the 60 second format so that we can get through more questions. So you do still have 90 seconds for this question. Do we spend too much, too little, or just the right proportion of the U.S. budget on defense? What percentage of the budget should go into defense? We spend too much for defense. The um, <laughs> defense industry. It has grown at a very large rate over the last 12 years. Basically, the first, the eight years of President Bush and the four years of President Obama have been boom years for the military industrial complex. It was Dwight Eisenhower who warned us of the evils of the military industrial complex. A good example of this is uh, refurbishing of old tanks. General Dynamics has a big contract to take ancient tanks and to refurbish them with new armor. The Defense Department did not want to, to refurbish them. They said they have no use. We have thousands of tanks that are perfectly functional. General Dynamics went to the House of Representatives and to the Senate and said, we want to keep this contract alive. So guess what happened? It was kept alive by the Congress. And Representative Lummis, is one of the big proponents of programs like this. Therefore, she is a big government, increase the defense industry proponent, and I believe that the defense industry could be, that the, that the budget of the Defense Department could be cut by one third without any danger of, of causing any problem with the defense of our country. We're spending far too much defending other countries. We should withdraw our troops from South Korea. South Korea is a prosperous country that can defend itself. We should withdraw our troops from Europe. Europe is prosperous and can defend itself. We should withdraw our troops from the Middle East. We cannot possibly solve any problems with the Middle Eastern countries fighting among themselves. I'm uncertain whether we're spending enough on defense of the United States, our homeland. There are a few things we should be doing, such as missile defense, that we're not. If we make other cuts that should be made, if we get out, get the federal government out of many activities where it is totally inappropriate and has no business functioning in the national government, the percentage of the budget that is spent on defense will rise. Not because we spend more on defense, but because we spend less on other inappropriate activities. <coughs> defense is actually the primary function of our national government, defense and foreign affairs. Our attempts to solve social problems in Washington with abysmal failures. That's where our concentration should be. Well, we, yeah, please, we, please 
speak into it directly? Okay. Uh, defense budget, I agree, is way over what it needs to be. Defense contractors, there's an entire industry here. My nephew loses his job. I don't care. I don't believe in the defense contractor business. We have a lot of good soldiers out there, young individuals learning to be responsible and accountable, serving our nation as soldiers. That is what our defense should be. The war in Afghanistan, the Jordanian I talked to one time said, think about if Al-Qaeda and the Taliban came to Wyoming and tried to force us into living like they want us to. Everybody would be in those mountains with their guns. They would not succeed. It's a waste of time. They defeated the bet and the Soviet Union, and I do not agree with that pattern of war at all. Um, I learned a long time ago that 90 seconds doesn't work very well for foreign policy, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick with it now and I'll behave this time. But the, um, I don't really have like a set percentage of what I think we should cut. I think random arbitrary numbers thrown out are not particularly helpful. Um, but I do agree with the Simpson Bowles proposal, which says that we should put everything on the table. Um, the budget as a whole requires us to be able to say, you know, if we're going to really talk about the deficit, we're really going to talk about spending, we can't take everything off the table. The Democrats have said that you know things like Social Security and Medicare have to be completely off the table, and the Republicans have taken defense completely off the table, so and hence we do nothing. And we are facing a serious financial problem that, to be honest, ideological sloganeering, um, partisan positioning um, is making this problem worse because we are not getting anything done. Um, at the same time, I think this really requires sort of careful oversight and, and combing through the defense budget to see where it is that we need to um, be able to address costs, um, where is it that we can save money, um, and if we are serious about the deficit, part of the reason why we need to be serious about those things is because the defense department does a lot of really important things. And if we can get our deficit under control, um, it will free us up more to be able to focus on doing that job well, rather than worrying about whether or not we're going to get the paychecks out or not. National defense is very important. It's one of the key roles of the federal government. Um, and I think national defense should be geared toward preventing invasion of the United States, um, which I don't think would require nearly the spending that we have right now. Uh, tasking with unclear missions of uh, nation building overseas or various other things, I think are outside of the purview of what national defense should be. Um, so I support uh, significant cuts in what is being called national defense, but what is in fact overseas expedition and forces. Um, and I think that that could happen at the same time that uh, it became a larger percentage of the federal budget because the federal government is doing a lot of things that it doesn't do that well. Uh, social programs, I believe, would be much better administered at the state or local level. Um, we're faced right now with spending in Congress that is unsustainable. We have a $1.3 trillion deficit, according to official figures, uh, according to spending commitments, the, uh, the, the fiscal account deficit is somewhere between five and $10 trillion a year. Um, these numbers are unsustainable. Um, and so we're faced with cuts by necessity, and I think we need to look at what the government can really do best. I agree with the recommendations from Simpson Bowles also to cut the military by 10%. I think we're going to be fighting different wars. It's a different world in the 21st century. We're not going to need the manpower of the military to be doing what we're doing. It's going to be technology-based. I think we're, uh, we need to uh, cut the manpower side because that's, that's where most of the money is spent. We need to be looking into research and development, and we need to uh, learn, from, learn from history like Afghanistan. I think we're going into Afghanistan with the best of intentions, but what we need to do is build the schools, build the roads, and get out of there. Uh, Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, they knew, don't even go there. So learn from our history, and yes, I think we should cut the military at 10%. Okay, the next question will be focused on legislative candidates. We're going to talk, start with um, uh, Dr. Connolly, and we'll end with uh, Mr. Nicholas. Um, what are your positions on the future of the Laramie Aquifer? Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
Sixty seconds. First part. I hope it's not up at this point. <laughs> it's right now. <laughs> All right. The Larry Aquifer is an incredibly important issue here in town. It is the the maintenance of our pristine water supply that that exists to the east of town. I've been going door to door in my district, and it is probably I think it's the number one issue that people want to talk to me about. And overwhelmingly, the response is, what can we do, both on a local and a state level, to make sure that we maintain the quality of that water? That being said, I think it is our responsibility on a state level to look at our Water Development Commission a little bit differently than we are right now. We're willing to, for example, spend the money to pipe water into Gillette but we're not willing to spend money to maintain our aquifer. So I think we need to kind of switch our priorities, or at least to look at our statutes a bit to see what we can do to maintain the water that we have so we don't need to start piping in water in a decade, two decades, or, or, or 100, years, 100 years from now. for protection, uh, you know, I think the issues here are uh, of what the studies are, it is uh, avoiding the vulnerable features. We need uh, uh, whether or not the western boundary is less than uh, 75 feet uh, of uh, the Sedanka formation. Um, uh, that 75 feet has been in all plans, whether or not the exposed bedrock is vulnerable. Um, and how to monitor new, uh, um, how to monitor monitor new development uh, tracking water quality. Uh, right now, uh, as far as I know, no one is really uh, talking about uh, what's going on with uh, removing, uh, uh, taking away property, or uh, removing regulations. The Laramie Aquifer is extremely important and we need to protect it. There are some other agendas, I think, involved in this that, that, that I'd like to tease out of it and just get down to the basic issue of protecting the aquifer. I don't think it needs to be a public playground. I don't think it needs to be a bridge to the forest. I don't think a lot of those things ought to be uh, good motives. What we need to do is pr protect the aquifer. Now, I'm not a big fan of rules and regulations, and I'm not a big fan of taking a man's property away from him bypass one rule and regulation after another. I think I agree that the Water Development Commission could be better involved. I think our city needs to get behind the bond issue. We need to generate the money. We need to go buy the man's property and then we can do with it what we want. It'll be ours. Uh, we do need to protect the aquifer uh, and I don't dispute that. I'm ready. I'm still ready all along to help in that any way I could. Well, I agree. I think that um, I realize that it's private property and that uh, it's up for sale. I think we need to buy that property. I was of the opinion that we should never, ever, in no circum under no circumstances, build or expand or develop over the aquifer. Um, I've since changed my opinion about that, and I'm thinking now, how can we best protect the aquifer? And that's the most important thing. That's our source of water. Are we going to be faced with... with um, should be bottled water into Laramie. I mean, what's going to happen if we if we compromise the uh, the integrity and the purity of the aquifer? So I think, as as Mr. Brown has indicated, buy the property and then we can decide how we're best protecting the aquifer. Well, I think we all agree how important water is, considering you can't live without water for more than a couple days. Um, I supported the fifteen million dollar appropriation last year. Actually, I think we all did. All the Albany County delegation <coughs> supported the $15 million appropriation. That was voted down by the Senate. Uh, those members of the committee thought the uh, community needed to do more. Um, afterwards, Representative Moniz talked to uh, State Land about trying to do a land swap. I supported that endeavor. Uh, unfortunately, that did not come to fruition. Um, but I do support protecting the aquifer. And uh, I think after protecting the aquifer, 
I do think those recreation interests are secondary, but are a great interest. And also, if we can uh, create access to the uh, National Forest, I think that is great as well. I think that would help the economy. Uh, as Representative Connolly said, it's the second highest revenue in our state, I believe she said. Yeah. Yeah, second highest. Um, so yeah, I support trying to protect the aquifer, come up with solutions. And if anybody has any solutions, feel free to make any recommendations. I think we've seen other places in Wyoming that are having significant problems with their water. We can easily mention Pavilion. Um, and so there's arguments over what happened in Pavilion, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Um, they can't drink their water, and that's certainly not something that we want to experience here in Laramie. Um, and we know that the aquifer is threatened. Um, we need to look at science to give us answers of what exactly we can do and can't do that is going to protect the aquifer. Because without the water, what will we do here um, in Laramie? Certainly, talk about bottling water and shipping it in. I, I can't even imagine that kind of community. I agree with Representative Brown. I think we need to identify the issues here. Uh, cut out the emotions. Water is critical to the city of Laramie, and that aquifer is critical to the city of Laramie. I don't think any of us wants to contaminate that water. Uh, so the issues ought to be based on sound science. Uh, I would also agree that if there's some way we could acquire that ground through, through proper means uh, and then manage the property appropriately. As Representative Green mentioned, uh, myself and Representative Green and Representative Brown uh, met for the state lands uh, folks and tried to, uh, to do a land swap. The state has uh, uh, state lands that are, are kind of bound, there's no way to get to them, so they were trying to do a land swap with the property owner. <laughs> the property owner at the present time is not willing to do so. So I, I think we need to continue to look, and, and, and I would support any effort to, to uh, help in that situation that doesn't violate anybody's property rights. Thank you. So I think the issue's been covered pretty well here. Uh, I'll be the first one to admit being up there in Carver County, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to your aquifer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's real important to you. And, and in reality, I think uh, a lot of times things, issues come up in the legislature that don't honestly belong there. I'm sure that every one of you in this room is more informed on how to keep your aquifer maintained than I ever could be. Uh, and you have far better incentives to do so because it's your drinking water, not mine. Uh, so in the legislature, I, I would view my perspective simply to be make sure that private property rights are maintained, that the people of Laramie uh, are able to, within that infrastructure of private property rights, able to, to do the things that they need to do. Uh, I think it's wrong to steal a man's land, even if it is for your water. You can come to terms, you can come to an agreement. Uh, you may not like it, but you also like to drink, so you gotta make some hard choices in life. <clears throat> anyway, I think uh, the fundamental principles here are, are local autonomy and private property rights. <coughs> I don't have a whole lot to contribute to what's already been said. It uh, just sort of proves the old adage in Wyoming about uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Mr. Nicholas. I I think you could develop over the, the aquifer safely if, uh, if you put in the resources to do it properly. But I also think that uh, it'd be unfortunate to, uh, to build on that area. We're lucky that it's principally held by one landowner. Once again, we, the difficulty we have coming up with a solution is when you have uh, the principal asset your community doesn't pay taxes, we find ourselves in a situation where you can't simply go out and create a property tax to, to acquire that property. We had a good solution, unfortunately, uh, largely the, uh, the, uh, that solution would have come to place except for the, the lobbying of the University of Wyoming Foundation members. It was an unfortunate lobby effort that they did to, to, to work against that effort. It's too bad it was there. But I think the, uh, we ought to uh, continue to persuade our colleagues that the investment uh, for the acquisition of that open space, when you compare it to the total investment you have in the university in over a couple billion dollars, it's a small investment to do pay to uh, preserve that viewscape and the aquifer itself. This next question focuses on health care. It is for everybody. Um, we will start with the um, U.S. House and Senate candidates. We will start with Mr. Otto uh, and end with Mr. Chestnut. 
Uh, and then for legislators, we'll start with Mr. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Nyquist, and then we'll down and, and end with Nicholas and Bob. How will Wyoming meet Obamacare requirements? In 60 seconds. Uh, first of all, if we pass the health care freedom amendment, uh, it will really give us some, um, some leeway to do that. So as far as uh, having to meet those commitments, I don't know. I, uh, I think actually um, it is somewhat more of a state issue than a, uh, a U.S. Senate issue. As a U.S. Senator, I think my job would be to try and uh, either stop Obamacare or the worst parts of that provision, the worst provisions um, of that bill. Yeah, I don't think it, at, at the Senate we're going to be looking at a different uh, thing about the way Obamacare is faced. I think what we need to do is take, we needed something in place. We've got that now. We need to tweak it. It's not perfect, but we need to have some provisions in there that are wonderful, uh, pre, pre existing conditions, things like that. I think uh, are something that's going to make us healthier as a society. Being able to pull resources is going to be something good. Um, I don't think we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We've got something, but let's just work with it and uh, and come together as a nation because we know it's a problem and we can't, uh, we're not allowing ourselves to turn our heads to it anymore. Uh, I think that. Um, I think ultimately Wyoming needs to do something, and, and I think what the what I'll do in the U.S. House is make sure that Wyoming has the opportunity to create an exchange that will allow for Wyoming to create something that will meet the needs of Wyoming. Um, most laws that are passed are sort of have almost a suburban focus. We have such a unique geography and a unique demographic layout um, that Wyoming really needs to be able to establish its own exchange. And because of the legal wranglings and the wait for the Supreme Court, um, a lot of those things didn't get done. Um, and we're now in the position of the you know, Wyomingites having to buy into a federal exchange. I think what we need to do is sort of give the state more time so that they can come up with a Wyoming solution and have that focus be more on coming up with a good solution rather than you know, rushing to have just something done. Libertarian, I definitely have to oppose the Obamacare debate. Would you speak more directly to the mic, please? Uh, and uh, the, the fact of the matter is, I work with a lot of working men and women out there, people with calluses on their hands, and they're paying more and more. Those people are the only source of revenue for this government. We can talk about all the oil and gas, but when it comes down to it, everything comes back lands <coughs> on the responsibility of those hands. If we don't start respecting the working people and the money they have to lay out, it's going to be a big problem. We have to worry about the working people. And I know a lot of the people involved in the Obamacare are the low-income working people. We need to reduce the taxes so that they can afford these things, rather than come up with more failed government programs. I favor the total repeal and elimination of Obamacare. The federal government has no place in medical care. After repealing Obamacare, there are other things that uh, then also can be cut. My wish to the legislature is that they would stand up to Obamacare and not set up an exchange. That's not my call coming from Washington. It's your call, but if you do decide to stand up to Obamacare, I will stand there for your protection. Our medical decisions will be better if they're kept out of Washington. Also better if they're kept out of Cheyenne. Medical care is a personal product. Its problems should be solved in the marketplace. Medical care is not a right. No one has Thank you. a right to others' income.
quite frankly, you won't find a lot of difference between the country party, the constitution party, and the libertarian party on this issue. The uh, Obamacare is going to be a disaster. I don't care how you look at it, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or other, it's going to be a disaster. The two options that the state has are the exchange and the Medicaid expansion. The exchange was initially not even on the table. We were going to be forced into, the, to, into having an exchange until um, the Supreme Court came down with a bizarre ruling that basically said we could decide whether or not we wanted a state exchange. Then it looked like the state exchange would cost us money, and the, the feds put it together, it wouldn't cost anything. And now that's in question because the feds say, well, we're not gonna pay for it, so you're gonna have to pay for it. It's a giant mess, folks. And it doesn't matter whether Obama or Romney is elected, if the Senate stays Democratic, we got Obamacare, and it's gonna be a disaster. Okay, Mr. Nyquist will start us up for the Legislative candidates. Well, I, I kind of believe that our health care policy has been broken for many, many years. Um, the system needs a drastic overhaul, and uh, personally, I do, uh, I, I do stand by the Affordable Care Act. I think it's a good start for uh, uh, single-payer health care. It's not perfect, but I think we can, uh, we can move onward and upward if we at least get something started, but to do nothing and expect the same thing, uh, or do the same thing and expect uh, this, uh, different results is the wrong answer here. Um, so uh, meanwhile, also, I, uh, while I'm at it, I, uh, our veterans, uh, I like to see them get or comprehensive uh, uh, medical and psychiatric, psychiatric care through the VA. Um, also uh, support family planning, sex education, and health care. Also support uh, uh, prescriptive you. medical marijuana. Well, we'll see if I'm right. I would say right now this is going to be the defining issue of the next session of the legislature. The United States Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional for the federal government to make us expand Medicare, Medicaid. So the question comes, are we going to expand Medicaid or not? I can tell you right now from some quarters of this state, all of us in the legislature can tell you exactly where it's going to come from. That, that as far as they're concerned, the train's already left the station. We're not expanding Medicaid. I think that they haven't heard some of the compelling stories yet that we're going to hear. I don't think that they've fully grappled with the argument the federal government's going to pay for all of it. On the other side, the governor says it may cost us as much as $160 million. Now, nobody wants an 8% cut, but they want to spend another $160 million on Medicaid. It is going to be a very difficult issue. I can't tell you which way I'm going to vote. I want to hear all the arguments and have all the information before I make a decision. There's no question that we need health care for the citizens of Wyoming. And what I'm interested in is uh, the people who are saying no Obamacare, absolutely no way, no how. What is your alternative then? What are you suggesting that we do in place of that? I mean, it's one thing to say no, 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 but come up with a plan that all of us can live with, and it's going to be fair and equitable to the people in Wyoming who really need and deserve to have health care. We have a very unique population, we have very unique rural communities, and I think our health care needs to address those two fundamental issues. So what's the alternative? What's the plan? It's all right to say no, but come up with an idea to help all of us resolve this issue and not just be harping on, no, 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 it's not going to work, it's going to be a disaster. Well, I think we already have universal health care in our country. It's called the ER. Um, in the state of Wyoming, there are $200 million of unpaid hospital bills to the ER last year. Medicaid recipients utilize the ER three times as often as people with private insurance. So how do we change that? And I don't know how we're going to change it necessarily. Uh, Department of Health came forward with 122 different options that we can look at. But I will say the two guiding principles that I will look at uh, to analyze the proposals are number one, what will provide better care for the individual, not coverage, but actual care for the person, and two, what are going to be the long-term costs and benefits? As 
And Representative Brown said it could cost over $100 million to increase Medicaid for all of these people. What are the long-term costs? Will that $100 million actually drive down costs in the long term? That's what I think we need to look at. I feel like some of the comments that have already been made um, highlight the problems that Wyoming has with Obamacare. Um, we have this attitude of, hell no, we're not going to do it. Um, and I think that is totally unrealistic. The Supreme Court has ruled on this. Obamacare is going to take place. It's not going to be fully repealed. And the attitude that we've had here in Wyoming is, we're not going to do anything. Um, we waited too long to deal with some of the um, health insurance exchange program. We couldn't come up with an idea. Now we're having to look at what the federal government is going to tell us to do. Um, and I think at the same time that we're doing this, we are really ignoring people's problems. Um, this issue is really um, something that I'm very passionate about. Um, as an adjunct instructor at UW, um, I, am not I do not qualify for health insurance benefits there. I cannot buy them from the university. My husband works for a small firm. For a number of years, they did not offer health insurance because they were so small they could not afford it. And I have a pre-existing condition. So I can tell you the struggles that I faced during this time period. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt that, that we think we need, uh, we do need some reform in healthcare. Uh, I'm not so sure that the ACA is the answer to that. Uh, we really don't know how the Affordable Care Act is going to affect the state of Wyoming yet. We're still looking at it. Uh, the governor has written a letter to the, to the Obama administration asking for an interpretation of just exactly how it is going to affect the state of Wyoming. But we do know that it's going to be expensive. Uh, Representative Brown mentioned the Medicaid expansion. I did look that up today. Uh, there's a, a report out that says that uh, through 2020, Medicaid expansion would cost the state of Wyoming 131.2 million. Uh, so it's definitely going to impact our our, uh, our budget, but it definitely is an issue that we'll have to deal with. We can't ignore it. And we do have, uh, as, as Representative Green said, he serves on the Labor and Health Committee. They've spent an enormous amount of time looking at all the issues. Again, uh, we're going to have to sort through that. The legislature, I agree with the Representative Brown, and be a major Thank issue you. for us. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think the health care problems here in America are caused almost entirely by the government itself. In the 1940s, the government imposed wage controls to try to prevent people from getting raises. As a try to work around that, employers started offering health care. <clears throat> The health insurance companies then managed to get themselves a loophole in the tax code. We then created a culture where third parties, either insurance companies, employers, or governments, pay for services that, that we choose. And as honest as we try to be, if someone else is paying the bills, we're not very conscientious about the services we consume. About seven years ago, my family went from a $50 a year deductible to a $10,000 a year deductible. Circumstances don't matter why. I can tell you right now, as hard as we tried before, to be honest, and not to use more than our fair share of insurance, uh, it's nothing compared to when the money came out of my own pocket to pay for it. We call doctors all around the state. We call everywhere. We look into every procedure that possibly can be. And this tell third party payers are gone, it won't be fixed. Well, as we all know, this is a very, very complex bill. Uh, obviously, our, the uh, so many of the congressmen didn't uh, didn't read the bill before they voted on it, and I think that there are so many unknowns for us right now that uh, as it's the the implementation of that is phased out over a period of time, and I know that the impacts are are probably unknown at this time. And so, uh, but fundamentally, I'm opposed to uh, forcing anyone into into uh, purchasing something. Uh, the Affordable uh, Health Care Act, I think. It, for us, anyway, uh, uh, I'm a county commissioner over in Carpenter County, and I know that we're self-insured right now. And trying to uh, figure out where we're going to go with our self-insurance program, which is extremely important to uh, us retaining our, our uh, folks over there, uh, it looks to me like that uh, if, if uh, we continue to, to um, work on that, we're going to be forced to, to abandon that. Uh, I'm anxious to see what kind of a bill is going to come out of our um, uh, in, in Congress, in the uh, state legislature, that we can vote on. Thank you. The, uh, the impacts of the Affordable Care Act have to be part of our budget analysis. 
if you're looking at a 4% cut to the Department of Health for this second year, the biennium, to be implemented into an 8% cut, uh, you do have to uh, begin to look at all options. We have to begin to look at our programs. We need to take care of our waiting list. We do have some services that are that are provided in Cadillac fashion that maybe we ought to reduce those services, provide more benefits to more folks. But by calculation, as I understand it, uh, speaking with the Department of Health today, when you implement the Affordable Care Act, you've got about 3,700 more employees or, that are going to come on that are what we call in the woodwork. About 6,800 families that, uh, uh, with children that will be affected, and the expansion is 17,000 people for a total of 30,000 folks that uh, over six years with the, uh, will provide about $864 million of benefits to the state. So just to take that off the table and say we're Thank not going to contemplate our options there, I don't think Thank there's you. a lot of, uh, I, I can stop at 60 and stop at 60, but uh, I don't think there's a um, lot of, I am out of time, that's it. <laughs> that's nice. To start with, I am incredibly so. grateful to live in a country and a town that if I had a heart attack right now, an ambulance would come pick me up and would take me to Iverson Hospital and I would be treated. How that gets paid for, we'll worry about later on. I'm incredibly fortunate, and I think all of us are. But we're in a system right now that relies on employers to provide health insurance for individuals and workers. And that's a system that's just not working. Make no, make no bones about it. The state right now is in enormous partnerships with the federal government regarding health care. Billy, our health care budget is billions for the biennium with a partnership with the federal government. Our challenge in the legislature will be to deal with an expansion or a different take on that partnership that we already have. And that will be with the health care exchanges and with the expansion of Medicaid. And that, again, is hard work. And it's hard work that we need to do. I have another question which focuses, focuses on uh, legislative candidates. I'm going to start with Mr. Jackson on the far end. Um, with the amount of money that Wyoming is spending on K-12 education, what is Wyoming doing to ensure accountability and results for the investment? Well, I spent uh, most of my life as an educator, 34 years actually as a teacher and as a principal, so I guess I probably have some opinions that are maybe very from uh, from what the normal folks would have. But uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, I think we don't have enough accountability on the administrative side of things. I think that uh, if you look at a school system, the most important person in that school system is the principal because he hires and fires, or she hires and fires uh, teachers. So we've got to have good qualified administrators that do the hiring and firing that understand what it takes to make a good teacher and have the intestinal fortitude to get rid of teachers through the uh, uh, the uh, continuing contract law uh, that don't belong in education, I'll counsel them to uh, some other position. So accountability starts with administrators. I think uh, accountability really ends with, with parents, students, and, and principals. Uh, <clears throat> I think too much of our education decisions are made at a state level or even at a school district level. When they ought to be probably made more at the level of parent-teacher associations. Uh, <clears throat> I think that our teachers, our principals, ought to be given far greater autonomy to do the things that they know what to do. Our current State Department of Education has become more like a State Department of Administrative Overhead and Standardized Testing. Um, we're pulling up the kids' roots so often to see how they're growing. You know, they can't get any chance to grow because we're testing them every three weeks. The accountability comes from parents. Uh, you can't fake it with a test. You can't fake it with legislative budgets. Until parents decide to get involved, nothing the legislature wants to do will be able to fix that problem in education. Well, I, I have to agree with both of, both of my counterparts on the left here. Uh, I would agree that we need to look at, uh, we've, we've been beating up on teachers uh, for quite some time now, and I really don't think that's where the problem is. I agree that we may not look at the administration. Uh, I also agree that uh, we need to look at our parents and, and, and what they're doing and how they're, how they're preparing our students for, for an education. Uh, and to close, we have spent a, nu a numerous amount of time uh, with set, uh, uh, select committees looking at this issue. Uh, they are going to bring some sort of a solution, I hope, back to us that we can vote on. 
And again, uh, I'm looking forward to what they have to tell us. K-12 education is a hugely complex issue. Um, these, these gentlemen have mentioned some of the, the issues that come into play, um, certainly that with parents, um, where kids start out from the first day of kindergarten. Um, and so there's lots of things that the legislature can't really control um, and we need to consider. Um, I think that teachers, um, as um, Glenn mentioned, um, have a lot that they can't control, that they um, have been beaten up on and it's not really um, everything that they can do. Um, I think when we're looking at comparing Wyoming's costs with other states too, we need to keep in mind um, the rural aspect of Wyoming's education and that those costs aren't necessarily easily transferred to looking at other states. Regarding K through 12 education, uh, I think we need to look at the successes within the state. Of course, Laramie High School was listed as one of the best high schools in the country this past year. And why is that? And I would argue it's because so many parents are involved within our community, and that makes the children involved in the community. And when the children want to learn, and the parents want their children to learn, that makes all the difference within the schools. And as I mentioned before, I don't think uh, hammering and criticizing the teachers is the uh, solution. I think we have to hold administrators accountable, teachers accountable, but also we need to create incentives for the parents to take accountability and for the students to take accountability for themselves. And fortunately tonight, we have probably six high school students in the uh, audience who are uh, taking uh, initiative for themselves. I believe very strongly in K-12 education. I think it's incredibly important because it develops our future. And I also think that we need to be uh, very positive in terms of this approach to uh, our analysis of the educational system. Teachers and, and administrators and absolutely parents are all stakeholders in this process. And to leave one or the other of those groups out is really a terrible mistake. And to pin the blame or the burden of education on the shoulders of an administrator or beat up on a teacher is just is so completely inappropriate. I mean, there's so many other solutions that are much more positive and much more productive than pointing fingers of blame. So I'm really in favor of a solution rather than um, a blaming attitude. But I mean, stakeholders all need to be at the table to share uh, their information and their, their input in this really important process. Look, here's the source of the frustration. We're the second highest funding model in the nation. The only state that beats us is New York. We're spending $15,997, $3 short of $16,000 a student. And when and, and I can tell you where the frustration comes from. When you look at the results, or the apparent results that we're getting, they're not there. We're in the middle of the road on tests. We've been in the middle of the road for a long time, but we're not moving. They've got a lawsuit in Colorado about it. They used Wyoming as an example and said Wyoming isn't even relevant. They're spending so much money and getting so little in results. We have over, over half of our supervisors in our school system have not been doing personnel evaluations, yet they want to have merit pay. What are you going to base merit pay on if you don't do evaluations? We've struggled. We're into the hardest part of this thing. This committee's going to result, uh, report to a select committee. The select committee's going to stir through it. I Thank hope you. we get a result, but that's the problem. I think we need to uh, support development of every student's abilities. I think uh, I, we do need to reform student testing to make it uh, a little timelier uh, for uh, everybody involved, students, parents, and uh, uh, teachers. I think, uh, I think we really need to uh, continue backing all our educators and stop uh, beating up educators for, uh, for failures of uh, uh, um, uh, parents to to help students to uh, get through their uh, um, classes. Thanks. I've been honored to serve on the House Education Committee for the past four years, where issues of accountability have really dominated our discussion. We spend about three point two billion dollars in the biennium for education in the state, we have an obligation to make sure that that money is spent well. 
but we want to do it in a way that assures that we are not wasting kids' time with meaningful testing, which has been a parent and a student complaint um, across the state. But on the other hand, we want meaningful measures in terms of understanding if that money is being spent well. So we do have an accountability committee that is coming up with, with mechanisms for that kind of evaluation. But I hope that in the next session, we can start moving from a discussion of accountability to a discussion of vision. I really think that we need to think about what's best for our kids and how do we best go about doing it rather than spending our time talking about a, a series of tests. I serve on the accountability committee. I mean, the legislature has set up this accountability committee, said that they do want to implement a program. You begin with problem though that only a small fraction of the work that's taught is actually tested in any fashion. So the uh, first struggle is to figure out how do you do a meaningful test of achievement um, and do it with the responsibility of an amount of time that's appropriate for testing and uh, then uh, after you figure out how to test every student, every class and look at achievement and look at achievement school, how to translate that into um, uh, a, a methodology to uh, that affects the funding or uh, implementing better teaching programs. So it's, it's a struggle. It's not going to happen over uh, uh, a year or two. It's going to be an ongoing, long-term solution. The, uh, the accountability committee has come up with um, uh, recommendations that I think will get implemented, but it'll take four or five years to get there. So, I want to thank all the candidates for <laughs> well, yeah, no further further participation this evening. We've ended the formal part of this program. Let me sit, let me give you two announcements over before we end. One is that the candidates are here, so you, they have a whole slew of questions up here I haven't been able to ask. So if you have a question you would like to, to address to somebody, please come up. Uh, I think they're going to they're willing to be around for a few minutes, so please take advantage of that opportunity. The second is simultaneously we will all be taking down this room as well, so I would ask for your help, particularly the stronger and younger people perhaps. Uh, and in this, as a final thought, I want to thank you for participating in this forum, and I particularly want to thank our candidates for running and for, for particip participating in this Q&A tonight. Thank you. One, one more uh, one more forum that we are sponsoring, and that will be for the uh, school district or school board. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. School board forum. It will be next Thursday from 7, uh, 7 to 9 p.m., and it will be at the Lincoln Community Center. So we hope to see some of you back for that one as well. And I have one since I do see, <coughs> yes, some, I, someone noted up there, several high school students here. Uh, there is going to be a voter registration, so if any of you are 18 years old, if somebody knows the date, I've forgotten, it was posted in the halls, so read the halls when you're back at the high school, and there is going to be a voter registration for uh, students at the high school who are 18 coming up, and that will give you your opportunity to vote. Thank you.
her youth group were the ones who were responsible for doing a lot of the setup and doing, printing the signs. So I do apologize for errors that are on, the, on our signs for the candidates. Um, I think Susan didn't intend to be out. She used a proof test somewhere the proofing that we've done, so I do apologize for that. Um, before we get started with the questions for the candidates tonight, I'd like to give, take a moment and go over some general information, as well as the precinct map and sample ballots. There is also um, a table at the back here with some general information. There's information on the back table there from the candidates who have brought promotional material, and sometimes they have biographical statements, those sorts of things. I didn't mean, check back there to see what all is there. There's also some informational material about the Laramie League of Women Voters and the League of Women Voters in general. So if you are interested in finding out more about the League, take a look. And there's also membership brochures as well if you're interested in becoming a member of our League. Uh, I think also on the back, and correct me, I've been out of town for the last two weeks and missed the last two forums, but I think we have flyers that give you information and pro-con information about the two tax initiatives that are going to be on the ballot. So we're not only voting for candidates, but there are some issues that will be on your ballots this time. Uh, the two ta local tax issues are the Albany County Transit <coughs> Services Tax and the Albany County Economic Development Tax, as well as an informational brochure about the constitutional amendment that is voted in. Is it just one amendment? Is that right, or is there two? There are three. 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 Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. And those those will be here shortly. I'm okay. They're not back there right now. Um, oh, uh, <coughs> since music does this reminder, they, we have done redistricting this year, so remember to check those maps and check your polling places because uh, you're apt to be voting in a different place than you have prior and you may be voting slightly, for slightly different uh, candidates based on redistricting and consolidation of precincts. So be real, real careful about checking those things. And if you've moved as a voter, you should also check with the clerk's office about where your polling place is and you need to give them your correct address. I think you actually have to physically go into the clerk's office to do the change of address. <coughs> The general election will be Tuesday, November 6th, with the polling places being open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Or you can vote early by completing a ballot at the county clerk's office or by requesting an absentee ballot from the clerk's office. Election information can be obtained from their website, and if you need a copy of their website, I've got it here, so come see me if you want the web address. Uh, the Laramie uh, League also publishes our voter guide. And that will be published on in the Sunday edition of the paper on October 28th. It's also uh, on the website. I think it's there now, right, Amy? I've got to check. Uh, yeah. Yes. So you can take a look at that now. And I have the link to the website for the lead, too, if you want to see me get that as well. Um, at this time, I'd like to give an opportunity for any candidates who are here tonight that are not up at the front table to answer questions to go ahead and stand up and you can briefly introduce yourself with who you are and what you're